here and thank you thank you very much to Turin the event which has just finished and welcome to Geneva so my name is Sarah O'Connor I write about the world of work for the Financial Times and I'm delighted to be here to help celebrate the ILO's 100th birthday we've just heard a bit about the history of the ILO and the world of work and today we're going to think about how our working lives might change over the next 100 years. Uh, so we're going to begin, we're very lucky to have Professor Richard Baldwin uh, from this very institute, who's going to come and give us a, a brief talk just to kind of set the scene and get our minds thinking. After that, I will introduce the panel. So, Richard. Well, thank you very much. If you don't mind, I'm going to sit down on the job here. Um, normally, I'd start with a thanks, and then an apology, and then tell a joke before I got started. But tonight, I only have four minutes, so I'm going to have to compress things a little bit. So here it goes. Thanks. Sorry, I don't have a joke. <laughs> My theme is how technology has changed the nature of work, changed the workplace, and changed the nature of work contracts. To oversimplify, to make a point, work has gone from steady to precarious, workplaces have gone from clustered to dispersed, and work contracts have weakened, shortened, or disappeared. To understand these trends, start with why the old school organization of work made sense. The first key point turns on the slow pace of change back then, 50s, 60s, and 70s, for example. Services and products changed less rapidly, and this meant that cost optimization was critical to profitability. This led to vertical organization silos focused on making processes and the people involved in them more efficient. This, in turn, implied physical clustering and hierarchy. Having all the workers and the bosses in the same building was a way of boosting efficiency. This physical closeness helped bosses establish hierarchy and help team members establish trust and cooperation. More broadly, stable employment was a key part of the cost optimization since firing and retraining was expensive. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a second part was the key aspects of old school information technology. Most service jobs required collecting lots of information. And back then, information was on paper and paper was in stored in folders in filing cabinets or in books on bookshelves. Pulling the information together actually meant physically looking through paper, which meant for efficiency, you wanted everybody near the paper. Moreover, talking to other people was a way of pulling together information, so it was important to have all the people sitting together. Most coordination was done by letter, so companies would have floors of typists, and to keep the inboxes near the outboxes, everybody had to show up to the office at nine, stay to five, they coordinated their lunch breaks and coffee breaks so that everybody could be there together. That's why back then, the phrase, I have to get to work, actually meant you were going somewhere, not just doing something like it is today. In short, the slow pace of change in poor information communication technology forced the hyper-clustering of work teams and the relative stability of employment relationships. Training a team and getting them to work together was a big investment for firms, so they tended to keep people to avoid disruption and reduce training costs. Good pensions and benefits and career advancement possibilities were part of this cost reduction strategy. Now, this old school organizational model works less, much less well today. Customers can change su suppliers and products much more quickly, so companies have to adapt faster. This new speed of change shifted competitiveness from cost optimization on standard products to innovation and adaptability. Getting the right product or service out quickly and staying up with the competition was more important than streamlining production processes for long-standing products or services. This undermined the need for strict hierarchies. The old static hierarchies, fixed desks, fixed contracts, and routine processes were replaced by agile structures, project-oriented corporate structures, and flatter management with cross-department teams. Today's companies need to be more flexible and adapt more rapidly. Remote workers on flexible contracts are a big part of that. 
but it means that the jobs are more precarious. The contracts have shortened, weakened, or disappeared, and workplaces have dematerialized. The second key change was the development of an amazing information and communication technology. Nowadays, information is available to anyone, anywhere, with a laptop and a secure connection to the web. There are no filing cabinets or bookcases, and in cyberspace, everybody's inbox is close to everybody's outbox. The buzzword that the consulting firm Accenture has developed to describe this new world is the liquid workforce. Now, much of this liquid workforce has been domestic, but there's lots of liquid labor abroad willing to work for much less than European and American workers. And this brings me to my new book. Did I mention my book yet? No? <laughs> Um, the Globotics Upheaval, where I argue that both globalization, international freelancing, and white-collar robots drive automation and globalization of service sector and professional jobs at an explosive pace. And both are changing the future of work. I don't have time to cover the main points of my book, but I'd say that Globotics is creating great opportunities for some, especially in emerging markets. It's essentially an export service opportunity but is creating great upheavals for many workers in rich countries. So let me close by noting that international governance has not kept up with this tech pace. The full cost of tech-driven changes are often now borne entirely by workers instead of being shared between workers, firms, and societies as they had before. Clearly, it's time for a rethink. And with that, I'll stop right there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Richard. What a lucid and thought-provoking way to start um, our event. So please could you um, welcome the panel to the stage. As they come up, I'm just going to tell you very quickly who they are. Uh, so we have Guy Ryder, who needs no introduction really, is the Director General of the ILO. Dame Vivian Hunt, who's the Managing Partner for the UK and Ireland at McKinsey. Amandeep Singh Gill, the Executive Director of the Secretariat for the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Christy Hoffman, the General Secretary of UNI, the Global Union. And finally, Nazreen Mani, who chairs the Skills and Education Committee for Business Unity South Africa. So please welcome them all to the stage. So we... Um, we heard some pretty stark analysis of the, of the way the world of work is changing there from Professor Richard Baldwin, dematerializing workplaces, precarious jobs, a liquid workforce. Um, what I would love to do to begin with is just to find out from all of you, I mean, you come from very different perspectives, different countries, what are the key trends that you are seeing that are shaping the changes in the world of work, and what sort of responses are you noticing are already bubbling up? Um, and maybe we could begin with Guy. Well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, great to see everybody here, and great uh, to follow on. Well, almost great, because one can suffer by comparison. Uh, great to speak after Professor Baldwin's introduction. In the work that the ILO has been doing on its centenary on the future of work, to answer your direct question, uh, four drivers of change, one obviously technology, although we are constantly warning, and Professor Baldwin might need a warning on this one, uh, not to fall into the trap of technological determinism. Technology is a big player in all of this, but is not necessarily the decisive or unalterable factor in the evolution of the future of work. We point as well uh, to demographics, and of course we have very divergent demographics taking place in different parts of the world. As Europeans, we tend to think about the issues of aging. Go to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, Southern Asia, you get a different perspective on that. The other one is climate change. Um, if we're taking seriously, and we're all going to the climate summit in New York in September, the fact that climate change is going to require a major rejigging of, of, of productive processes around the world, that has to be factored into the way the future of work is organized. And finally, for somebody of my age who's been sort of knocking around the world of work for the last 30 years, We've always sort of operated on the assumption of ever deepening and accelerating globalization as a way we're gonna organize the world of work. I suspect with some of the politics going on around the world right now, 
that's not a safe assumption any longer, and that's going to uh, that's going to make a big difference. But just to come back and sort of respond a little bit to Professor Baldwin's introduction, we see all of these elements affecting, conditioning the direction of change in the world of work. I think the real key point to make here, and it is something that comes from the, what the ILO has been trying to do for 100 years, is what about social preferences? What happens if I would say to Professor Baldwin, I don't like that liquid workforce. I don't like that dematerializing workplace that you point to. Do we treat it as an inevitability? Something which is moving towards something that a lot of people in the world would not really want, or do we actually say it is for us actually to put in place a world of work that we would, in the image of what we would like to see? So the whole issue of human agency, I think, for an organization like ours that brings together governments, trade unions, and employers' organizations is fundamental to the equation. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And Dame Vivian, I mean, Guy was talking there a bit about determinism and to what extent are these things set in stone. You obviously spend a lot of time talking to some of the world's biggest companies. They're shaping all of this. To what extent do you think they're in the driving seat or are they actually having to respond themselves to these trends? Well, it's an interesting concept of agency because at the, a, a micro or a firm level, what we would really counsel our clients to do is to understand and know, be able to quantify the impact of these macro trends but there's no inevitable outcome. There's a huge distribution of performance um, from firms, a huge distribution of how labor is structured in different firms. Um, the context for uh, growth uh, or not is very different. And how do you take the formula or the cards you're dealt as a specific firm or a specific manager and try to have the best outcomes for your shareholders and your employees and customer and society? and not trade off the objectives of one of those versus the others. It was interesting in the opening video, it really speaks to the ILO being formed as the collision of these different forces of work came together and wanting to have a more integrated response is really one of the birthplaces of the ILO. The quantum of change that we're going through now in the structure and the nature of work is probably bigger than what we went through 100 years ago. And so it's good to know what the macro trends are. It's good not to ignore them, but we'd say it's understanding the degree of disruption and that the degree of disruption is at task level. 60% of jobs will be restructured or affected by technology. 30% of activities will either disappear or be entirely restructured. So it means all of us have to change. It's not about technology making jobs go disappear or something as simplistic as that. It's about the how do you really restructure and reskill work. In the West, uh, slower growth, aging economies, the issue is about reskilling. The changes in pensions also mean that nine out of 10 workers who are in the workforce today will be working, they'll need to work, and they'll want to work in another 10 years. Different from an India or Brazil or a Southeast Asia economy, the Middle East that's dealing with huge youth populations and creating meaningful work um, to, in those places. And so the quantum of disruption is very significant. It really does affect job structure and the responsibility that you know, our clients and every organization has to do is to look at those skill sets and think how am I gonna restructure my workforce to manage this change, not simply wait for the, the aftershocks to hit me because the companies that act more proactively will get better results. Fantastic, and on, on sort of acting proactively, I just wanted to come to you Ambassador, um, to ask you a bit about the work that the UN Secretary General has been doing because um, he's convened a high-level panel to look at digital cooperation. And I just wonder if you could share with us what kind of insights uh, the UN is hoping to gain from that and maybe, you know, with that more international focus. Thank you. Uh, the panel, which is led by Jack Ma and Melinda Gates, uh, has done a global outreach. Uh, so uh, we've gone to the field, in a sense, uh, uh, India, China, Africa, Israel, Silicon Valley, places of tech dynamism, places where there is tech pessimism, places where governments uh, and uh, people in general feel that the digital transformation is happening to them. They don't have the agency. The word was used just recently. Uh, so the picture is very mixed. Um, um, uh, Richard described some of the negative trends in the West, but there is great optimism uh, in places where hard infrastructure is being created, where the removal of poverty itself is creating jobs. 
so as you go from, let's say, a couple thousand uh, dollars per capita to six, seven thousand per capita, there is huge job creation. So there is pessimism there, whereas that's not the, so that's the first thing we've noticed. The second thing we've noticed is a hunger for policy, for governance. Uh, so governments are struggling uh, to get a handle uh, on the change, and they are struggling to update their policy instruments. Our metrics, our economic policy tools, our regulatory tools are essentially 19th century or 20th century. Whereas if you look at the economy today, uh, there is no ring-fenced digital economy. The entire economy is digitalizing. So uh, the government's are struggling to come up with answers. And you would be surprised to read, for example, the new US policy on artificial intelligence. Uh, it's industrial policy, something that uh, the U.S. won't touch with a barge pole. Uh, so that's the second thing uh, that uh, we've noticed. The third thing is, uh, in order to make an impact, uh, the world very quickly needs to learn to work together in different ways, across subject solo silos, across borders. And frankly, the situation today is not good for working together. Uh, there is lack of trust, and tech itself is playing a role in undermining some of the trust. Uh, there is uh, an economic, uh, political, almost military competition around AI. So there's a need to create that trustworthiness ingredient for uh, cooperation. And I'll come back to this in terms of what we are thinking should be the call out to the world uh, to, uh, to um, uh, in this 100th year, there are many anniversaries this year. It's the 30th anniversary of the web, 100th anniversary of the ILO, so it's a good time to be reflecting on these issues. Fantastic. And, um, you know, on that, on that note of there being a hunger for policy, I wonder, um, Christy, if there's also a hunger for collective action and actually what is the role here for trade unions in, um, in sort of helping to deal with smooth combat even some of these changes that we're seeing. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me say happy birthday to the ILO and for giving us the 100 year of experience of dealing with the issues facing the world's workers and employers um, and giving us the occasion to be here. For UNI, my organization represents workers across 11 sectors in the services economy. And for us, it's not the future world of work, it's the new world of work, because this is not something that's gonna happen 10 years from now. It's a gradual process, which has already begun. Um, in the world of work in general, we're looking at flat wages, growing wealth and income inequality across the world and within countries. Um, increasingly uh, attacks on collective bargaining, a diminishing role for collective bargaining, um, attached to growing monopoly power across some of the across some of the key industries. So that, as a backdrop, it, is somewhat negative. But our perspective is we want to harness the power of new technology so that we can reverse these trends and have a fair share for workers in progress going forward. We do not believe that um, the precarious, uh, temporary uh, contract, de you know, self-employed workers, that trend is driven by technology. It's accelerated, yes, it's made possible in some cases, but it's not an outcome that's, that's foreseen, that's automatic, and that we, we do think it's a social choice, a choice around regulation. Um, this is the biggest concern right now, facing the workforce that we represent, and I think most of the workers of the world. It's not a question of will there be jobs, because there are more jobs now in our sectors than there were even five years ago, with a few exceptions, but it's really a question of what kind of jobs and how can we, co how can we um, confront this question of the insecurity of the jobs that we see that have been created, especially since 2008. It, we see this emerging trend in the temporary workforce, which again, I would stress, I don't think it's foreseen or preordained that let's say half of the workforce of a giant tech company working side by side with full-time employees that the other half uh, you know, 122,000 workers should be temporary. There is something wrong with that picture. Um, and Nazreen, finally, I mean, Christy says there's something wrong with that picture. If you kind of fast forward those trends, I mean, one thing that a lot of people worry about is a kind of increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. 
uh, and everyone else kind of left in this sort of hinterland of precarious um, living. Is your, is your sense that that's the way things are going and is that an inevitability in your eyes? Thank you so much. Um, so I think let me just position and contextualize who I'm speaking on behalf. So um, I'm sitting on behalf of the private sector, so on behalf of the International Organization of Employers, and that's the views of 50 million companies in 130 plus countries. Um, and I think a short answer to your question is it's far more complex than that. Um, I think we have to appreciate that the notion of the future of work or this changing world of work um, is highly um, fragmented. It's very diverse from region to region. Um, I think we have to deal with changes of a changing workforce. Um, we've spoken, several uh, of our speakers today have spoken about uh, a younger workforce. Um, in Africa in particular, where I come from, uh, we're looking at 800 million young people joining the workforce by 2050. We don't have work for them. Um, so if we had to say, yes, concentration of wealth in the hands of few, then yes, a pessimist would say, I agree. Mm -hmm. But I think what we can see is that there's so much opportunity, as Amandeep has said, um, and I think we have to embrace that and we have to look at the change as an opportunity to revise the way that we work. And I don't think as the private sector we mean to exploit workers. That's not the intention. Um, the IOE celebrates its centenary next year um, and social dialogue and partnership uh, with social partners has been fundamental to the existence of the IOE and I think going forward um, in creating sustainable economies that can withstand these changes positively uh, means that we have to engage, we have to partner um, and we have to face the challenges, positive and negative together. We have to work through the solutions um, and not simply be afraid of it and I think often when we talk about technology <laughs> Uh, we're afraid of the techn technological impact um, of what the future of world may bring. But I think if we move past the fear, uh, particularly in emerging economies and developing countries, there's so much opportunity uh, that can shift where we're at now. Uh, you know, I come from a country where officially there's 27% unemployment. Unofficially, we're closer to 50%. We have 55% youth unemployment. Um, those are unsustainable figures if we don't change how we work and clearly the traditional models um, need to shift. Um, so how do we structure the world of work? What is the role of the private sector in that? Um, we want to partner, we want to shape that future um, so that we don't sit here 100 years from now asking if wealth has been concentrated in the hands of few. Uh, because I think the other short answer, and I know I'm being recorded, but we're not the people sitting here with the wealth on the table. Um, so how do we distribute it equitably? Um, so social justice, yes, is an important issue, uh, but inclusive economic growth is equally important. Um, how do we filter these developments throughout the population, um, and not just young people, but for all participants in the economy? Um, so on that note, I mean, I think there's, there's some disagreement on the panel about the extent to which uh, these things are inevitable, the extent to which they're driven by technology, by companies, by um, conscious choices or, or not. But it seems as if you all sort of agree that actually there's a big role for policy here. And so I'm interested to hear from all of your perspectives. And I'll just ask one question to you all, which is, um, you know, lots of international commitments have been made around things like ensuring decent work, tackling climate change, dealing well with migration. What is your sense as how as to how well policymakers are achieving those kind of internationally agreed goals, particularly at the, at the national level. Maybe, maybe Nasrin, we can just start with you. Thanks, Eva. I think we have to agree that policies to uh, address these issues require looking at equal opportunities, uh, bringing more women into the workforce, bringing more young people into the workforce. Um, but we also require economic growth because we can't have a policy vacuum uh, where we have this policy uncertainty uh, because there isn't the economic development and sustainable growth to support the implementation of policies. Um, and I think the one issue we find often in South Africa um, is we have fantastic policies. We have some of the best legislation in the world, but fiscally we can't implement. Um, and I think we mustn't have that policy disconnect. So when we're doing policy, it can't be in a vacuum. Yes, policy is idealistic, I understand that, 
uh, but we also have to be realistic about the kind of world that we live in and how can we shape incremental change. Yeah, I think just, just, just taking the direction of the conversation that the, the key issue is here is where globotics intersects with this hunger for policy, which uh, I'm really encouraged to hear about because you know, if one thing has been notable about the last 20 or 30 years, at least as it relates to labor, you know, there hasn't been a hell of a lot of appetite for, for, for policy. Could I use the word regulation? It's been rather the opposite. So I think how we get this intersection is gonna be really very interesting. And I think that's really where human agency and the underlying currents of change are gonna come into interaction in a very interesting way. Um, one thing I think that I would say is that I think we have, and this conversation I think is, is, is illustrative of it, we really do have to elevate world of work issues above the status of a residual in policy making, which I think it's tended to occupy. Once you get the financial piece right, once you get trade policy right, once you get innovation and technology policy right, let's have a look at what that means for the world of work and for labor markets. And I think there needs to be a reordering or a, or, or a synthesizing of issues uh, in a slightly different way. I think part of the bad news in this otherwise somewhat encouraging uh, scenario is internationally, and I'll, I'll pick up what the ambassador said, internationally we're not in good shape. Uh, I, I don't think the international cooperation uh, piece of this agenda, because of the low levels of trust, because of the tensions that we're observing in different arena at the moment, this is something we have to get over. And there's a bit of a chicken and egg here because I think some of the things we're talking about are actually at the origin of the tensions and the tensions are now in the way of us dealing with those problems. So it'd be nice to break out of that uh, not very virtuous circle. But I, but I might go even further and say that governments who are both you know, policy setters as well as the large and often the lead employer in most countries and businesses have to make concrete choices about how they're gonna structure and manage that workforce. So the notion of making strategic choices about your customers, about technologies investments, that seems obvious, but how you then structure your workforce in collaboration with them and good practices is as explicit a choice and needs to be as architect because architected, because on its own, it won't necessarily produce all of the good outcomes that we probably do all share from our different perspectives. The second thing is you have to know which things to do first. And um, a, a piece of research that we did uh, a few years ago, just picking up your theme about gender participation in the workforce, which across countries, whether it's a develop, fast growth developing economies or, or um, slow growth uh, developed economy, the single biggest participation lever we can pull is increasing gender parity and gender participation in the workforce and that can add a significant amount to all economies as literally as more women at work in India or Brazil um, or more in a more refined way certain job categories and segments but there's almost no economy in the world that it doesn't represent between 2 and even 10 or 12 percent of GVA GDP um, and so some things are shared good ideas best practices innovative solutions from governments from from businesses can be shared other things are more bespoke and specific but if we get the big things right like gender participation like health and safety standards would be something, another example, technology training standards, you can still make a lot of progress. Yeah, I mean, I, let me just say on, on policy questions, I, I have to say I also agree with Guy that, that, that worker policy shouldn't be less, they should be part of the big picture, and, and that has to be, um, that has to be a priority when it comes to addressing some of these key social questions that we face, including polarization and distrust in, in our multilateral institutions. I, the ILO Commission on the World of Work just issued its report called Work for a Brighter Future, and I think that report contains some really key policy uh, recommendations, but the one that I would mention here is the importance of social dialogue and collective bargaining at the heart of addressing a whole range of problems uh, and whole range of issues and structuring work. And that comes back to your point of if the work is structured and, and there's collaboration. I think when you look at inequality, when you look at so many of the issues that day to day right now the work, workers are confronting, enabled by new technology, for example, you know, a 12 hours of work per week for a worker in retail, which 
That would not have happened 10 years ago. That's enabled because the, the technology enables the employer to know exactly when the customers are gonna be there and predict this. We can resolve some of these issues through collective bargaining, through social dialogue, through regulation as well. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of opportunities for that. But all of this needs a strengthened uh, collective bargaining institutions, collective institutions, both employers and unions, to come together and confront and deal with some of these issues. Training, there's a whole range of issues that we would all identify as what are the policy issues that emerge under this big umbrella of new technology. And I think having uh, social dialogue and collective bargaining at the core would be our message. Finally, Amandeep, I mean, you have a lot of example of trying to um, coordinate policy at an international level. Maybe you can give us a couple of quick tips. I think uh, we saw at the beginning in the video those three keys turning together. And what we need to see today in terms of three keys coming together, one, uh, we need common rails uh, to incentivize innovation, to incentivize uh, uh, setting up of businesses uh, to solve uh, actual problems which have been identified as in the SDGs framework. Second, we need guardrails. So, a uh, guy you mentioned regulation, so smart regulation, not heavy regulation. Uh, guardrails to uh, prevent uh, uh, inequities from widening, people just falling off uh, uh, the, the economic uh, uh, and social landscape. And the third thing we need is human capacity. Uh, so, we all talk of lifelong uh, learning, uh, but I think the reskilling that's needed today, the scale of this, Ha, ha, this something like this has never been seen before. There are some very conservative estimates. 120 million would need to be reskilled in the next three years in the 10 top economies. Uh, that's IBM research. Uh, so governments are not prepared for this. So this brings me back to this. I think you asked how we are doing on those goals. Uh, I don't know where we would have been uh, without China's growth on the MDGs and possibly the SDGs would be saved by India's growth and growth of you know, dynamic parts of Africa. But that's happening because of other factors. So we are underperforming in terms of international policy. And that's where the massive gains are. If we can turn those three keys together, that'd be uh, wonderful. Right, at this point, we're gonna break off to uh, watch a short video. This is some voices from students here at the uh, Graduate Institute from Geneva talking about their own hopes and fears for the uh, future world of work. So let's just watch that quickly. Hi, my name is Adil Nyambasha and I'm from Zimbabwe. My hope for the future of work is that um, work in general be more accessible to people who come from less privileged economic backgrounds. And I think they're just as qualified, as eager candidates in the developing world. Um, and I think uh, if there can be ways to attract those industries so that they also come to you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, that would be great. Baraka Godley and I'm from um, Edinburgh, Scotland. I have a lot of friends who have graduated from wonderful universities with great qualifications and are finding it really hard to find jobs that are really interesting and suit their qualifications and their experiences. My name is Ding Feng and I am from China. My hopes for the future of the work is that people are able to work at homes, at anywhere they would want. Mi nombre es Mariana Rosales y vengo de Costa Rica. El problema es que no nos está alcanzando con la capacitación académica que recibimos en las universidades. La mayoría de mis ex compañeros de eh, secundaria, luego de haber estudiado por años en una universidad, lamentablemente no encuentran un trabajo que que los permita realizarse adecuadamente. My name is Karun Gopinath and I'm from India. The effort and the progress that we've made to overcome the technological gap and the communication gap, I think making the world a smaller place allows me, an Indian, to come all the way to Switzerland, seek work, or it could be anybody else going the other way around. I'm Catherine McDonald's and I'm from Canada. My key recommendation would be to increase skills-based training uh, because with the different climate ch uh, changes and also with demographic shifts and the fourth industrial revolution, there are a lot of skills that young people are lacking uh, within traditional education. Striking, uh, quite striking there, Amandeep, that a lot of those young people mentioned the very point that you concluded on, which is around skills and reskilling and their anxiety that maybe they're not necessarily getting 
the right kind of preparation for the world that they know is, is coming. So let's turn to the future. Um, young people like that are going to live with the new world of work for, for longer, probably, than most of us on this panel. Um, what do we need to do to make sure that they have happy, fulfilled, prosperous futures? That's the same question to all of you. Who, wa who wants to start? Um, well, it's interesting, Sarah, that the students highlighted skills, and I think um, something that goes unnoticed often is it's not just the hard technical skills, uh, and we talk about soft skills, and I quite I dislike that terminology because actually they're core fundamental skills to make the world of work uh, more applicable, more relevant, um, and I think that's something that we have to focus on, and uh, we have several strategies at the moment back. Um, across different parts of Africa, looking at work readiness training. So what are those core skills that will make people, equip young people to function in the workplace, um, whether it's communication skills, uh, whether it's uh, technological skills, you know, again, coming down to mobile communication, different forms of technology, um, engaging on how to budget. <laughs> so if you've never worked or if you have multi-generational unemployment in a home, um, how do you manage an income suddenly when you probably the sole um, income uh, generator in the household? And those are factors uh, that are very important in developing countries and, and, and perhaps the developed world takes for granted, uh, but they, they're important skills to make the future um, easier to manage um, and to navigate. Um, I think also what we're seeing is the need for that social dialogue that policy shift. Um, and I think when we talk about the world of work, we need to have more voices of young people. Um, I, I think we often, it, it was good to hear them. And I know yesterday when DG was at the uh, United Nations, you, you heard the voice of the youth. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it, we, we need to make sure that when we're designing and developing policy, that they front and center in shaping that policy because it's the future they're going to live. <laughs> Um, and how do we shift that? Um, and I think, again, it's looking at new industries. Um, and as the private sectors, the IOE, we're looking at new areas to focus on non-traditional sectors, but also how to revive our traditional sectors, um, how to regenerate manufacturing, uh, mining, um, taking into account those um, environmental challenges that come with many of those sectors. Uh, but I think an interesting question that we need to pose is, do we um, challenge developing countries and punish them because they've been slow to take up the pace of development, but we put emissions targets on developing countries, we put um, lots of barriers sometimes to entry, um, and how do we navigate that? Because what is the cost for development when you're playing catch up, as much of Africa is, for example, or Asia? Um, and, and those are difficult questions to, to answer, uh, but those are the hard conversations that we need to also have. We can't skirt those. Um, and, and I come back to you know, the report from the Global, Global Commission on the Future of Work um, is encouraging. Um, it, it has a range of um, solutions, uh, but I think we also need to understand what is feasible and what is not. Um, who's going to fund it? Um, something that we find um, lacking to some degree is uh, the recognition of the private sector in shaping this future of work. Um, and, and how is the private sector brought on board as the partner to governments, to trade unions, um, to ensure that the interests of government and workers and employers um, are protected, uh, but also developed so that we can adapt to this changing world of work. <laughs> Amandeep looks like he's keen to jump in. Yes, so, uh, and uh, as they say in French, uh, ça tombe bien, because I have to go across the lake to speak to a bunch of students from the International School about uh, AI and education, education in the age of AI. Uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of gloom and doom about how robo robots and algorithms are going to take jobs away, but I think it, uh, the, the fundamental nature of these technologies is um, uh, cross-domain artisanal, so you need to come together with different skill sets to, to
to construct the solutions uh, uh, and uh, make those businesses work and gain the trust of consumers. So I think there's a huge opportunity out there, but we'll have to rejig our education systems. The, the cells and bells system is not going to work for the age of uh, uh, AI. And we will have to make learning uh, accessible more broadly, portable, so that you don't end with degrees and diplomas, uh, which, by the way, should in any, in any case have a uh, sale-by uh, date, uh, uh, expiry date on them. So uh, students should end with clarity about future learning pathways, not with a degree or diploma. So that's the kind of liquidity in the workforce that uh, we should be aspiring for. And there are good examples from around the world uh, that are currently been, we need to mainstream them and have an internet have the international cooperation discussions uh, uh, around them and uh, all the questions that the audience might have for me please direct them to richard because he's going to take my place shortly <laughs> thank you so much thank for your contributions the ambassador describes a very intricate approach but that is what is required because you know in the voices of from the video i heard one was we want opportunity and I think a lot of young people and a lot of um, employers are agnostic to where that opportunity comes from. It's a global opportunity. You've got to be able to access it. You want to be able to have mobility, but you also want to know that that's creating good, high-quality jobs, not just an efficiency market or exploiting labor um, and technologies in the wrong way. The second thing they clearly need are the skill sets and this notion of um, lifelong learning, but employers also working to take responsibility for this Scaling, skilling and training. You know, some of the best examples we have of employers who've worked on reskilling at scale are for helping to prepare, yes, to restructure, sometimes reduce, sometimes make more efficient the workforce, but it's also creating new jobs. It's creating task and skill level badges. It's helping employees manage their finances so that they can go on to new work. It's having the people who want to work in more flexible, quote, gig economy choose that, but not force people who don't choose that into precarious work. And that requires a much more integrative approach that often is more productive in a shareholder creation, value, shareholder and investor frame as well. So the things don't have to be in comp conflict, but it requires a more integrated approach in thinking the things through. And the last thing I heard is agency. You know, we want to be able to direct and guide our future. They're not asking any employer or a trade union or government to hand them something. They're saying, let me be a protagonist and, a, and have agency in how we navigate this. So I was uh, actually quite encouraged by the voices of the, uh, the students. Well, speaking of giving people agency, I'm conscious of the time and we need to squeeze some questions in to give you all some agency to make your own points. Um, so if you have a question for the panel, stick your hand up um, and then uh, we will take it from there. So let me see, what I might do is take a few at a time just to make sure that we squeeze as many in as possible. So there is a gentleman in a red jumper here and there is a woman in a white t-shirt over there and then there is a woman right at the back there with a white hat on. So we'll take those three first and just tell us quickly who you are as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Hill, a civil society activist. Uh, not in the world of work anymore. Uh, I wanted to ask a question of Professor uh, Baldwin, but then also expand a bit on a couple of things that Mr. Ryder alluded to. Uh, so would you agree, uh, Professor Baldwin, that <clears throat> let's say in the past 20 years or so, there's been a shift in the distribution of value added from workers towards shareholders? Uh, I've seen some statistics. I don't know whether you agree with that. And then Mr. Ryder hinted to some things that I think are worth, uh, worth stressing. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, basically, we've all lived in a capitalist system, whether we like it or not. Uh, and it's been a, what they call a neoliberal system in which basically we've been uh, putting a premium on profitability and shareholder value and kind of forgetting about workers. You said finance and capitalism uh, are taking uh, the forefront. And so that's yielded some very strange political results, which we've all seen. Brexit, the election of uh, President Trump, uh, Salvini in Italy, you go on, you name it. Uh, and <clears throat> what I wanted to say, I don't know how many people in this room are aware of it, but there are currently plans underfoot, and UniGlobal is well aware of them, to use the w World Trade Organization to make some agreements regarding what they call e-commerce, which in reality will simply have the effect of continuing the system of shifting value to a few people in Silicon Valley and maybe in China. So I don't know if you care to comment on that. It's a bit provocative. Thank you. We like provocative questions. Thank you very much. 
Uh, yes, lady over there. I will try to be as provocative as well, hopefully. <laughs> my name is Defne Gönanç. I recently completed my PhD in political science at the Institute. I'm trying to stay in the workforce despite um, the pool of uh, short-term contracts, unfortunately, especially for the recent graduates. I wonder how much to what extent the robotization and the transformations in technology promise a more equitable distribution of work in the future. Because right now, the ones who have a job have to work uh, um, approximately 12 hours maybe and uh, have to fly from different countries to countries. I don't know how many countries you have to visit in one week. Uh, and the ones who are unemployed are constantly looking for jobs. So does the future promise us a more equitable share of work? Thank you. That is a great question. Thank you very much. And then finally, yes, the woman at the back. Hi, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for being here. First of all, my name is Gabriella and I am a first year master's student here at the Institute. And my question for all of you is, in the context of the concerning trend of unpaid internships for young people worldwide, what are your thoughts on vocational education and apprenticeships in, as let's say, alternatives to curb these concerning trends and ensuring more dignified and equal opportunities for youth around the world. Thank you. Thank you. I like the uh, knowing chuckle from the audience there about unpaid internships. Quite right. Uh, brilliant. Okay, so we've got a question about the shift of value from labor to shareholders. Uh, a question about the distribution of work. Very interesting. And also, uh, what about vocational education? Is that a more dignified future for young people? Who wants to chip in? Richard, maybe you want to start. Oh, sorry. No, Christy, you start. So let me, let me do the labor share first. Um, it's, it's undeniable that the labor share of income and a share of GDP is falling. That's absolutely clear. It's been going on for a while. But I would characterize it more as a shift of value creation from capital to knowledge. And the concentration of knowledge in people's heads and in companies is what's changed ex in extreme ways. So I think there's been a shift away from labor in, in many ways, but not all labor. People have lots of knowledge in their heads are actually making way more than they were before. So I'll, I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Uh, I was going to respond to the woman who's a PhD student who made a um, question about equitable distribution. But first on labor share, I do have to say it is a shift away from workers in general, a big shift. And it's happening, you know, for a long time. So I don't, I don't think we can... Uh, I don't think we can ignore that trend, and there's got to be a he some a range of policy measures that change that, but one of which is having a worker voice and, and an increased worker voice to balance the power. But on this question of short-term contracts um, and a more equitable distribution, this is a key issue that I see facing young people entering the job market, is how do you break into a secure open-ended contract, full-time job, or at least a job that has enough hours to live on. And um, I think that's where we really do need to look at some policy questions. How do, because our structure now, our benefits, uh, whether it's paid time off or in many countries, insurance benefits, pension benefits are all linked to full-time employment and long-term employment. And we really have to shift that so that workers who are not in that employment relationship have a right, have a right to social protection, have a right to a living wage, have a right even to bargain where many don't have it now. And I, that's something that emerged out of the, the future uh, world of work, the commission report called the universal labor guarantee. But I think that's very important. I think there's also ways to regulate the, the number of f short term contracts or temporary agency contracts that a lot of governments have experimented with. But this question I think is, is really, Central, whether we can decrease the hours for some of those who are working 60 or more, which is the case. All the studies show that there's a huge cluster of population that's working too many hours and a huge number are working too few. And how we regulate that and equalize that, that's a big challenge. But I, I agree that many would wish to have fewer hours and, and, and many absolutely need more hours. And um, so I think that's a central challenge for young workers. Can I uh, ju just chip in very much on, on, on the same lines? Uh, I mean, you can characterize this shift in the late, this decrease in labor share of national income as you would wish, but it is clearly uh, reflective of a shift of income from, from uh, 
from labor to capital, compounded by a shift of income within the labor sector, higher returns to skilled, high knowledge labor, and a real stagnation, if not reduction, at the lower end of the labor market. Um, on working time, I just agree very much with what Christie said. We've got some real issues around working time. One of the students was saying, it'd be great to be able to work anywhere, anytime. Maybe it's not so great to be required to work at any place at any time. Very much a two-sided coin. Both of these things reflect the duality in labor markets and the risks of further polarization of labor markets, which I think goes hand in hand with this liquidity of, of the labor force. And I just want to pick up on the internship story. We have an internship program at the ILO. We pay all of our internees. We would not we would not run an unpaid internship course. One, it's always a good way to get a, a round of applause for the young audience. One, because it would be abusive, and it would be abusive. But secondly, I'm even more moved by this consideration. It is one of the worst obstacles to social mobility that you can imagine in a labor market. If you make an unpaid interneeship, the, a critical gateway to progression uh, in working life. You're acting like an 18, no, the, the admission uh, policies of an 18th century British university. You know, the sons and daughters of aristocrats get on in the world. The rest of us just can't afford to, to even get on, the, get on the train. Well, we certainly share that view, uh, both as McKinsey as well as um, a council with respect to the internships. We hire lots and lots of young people, and all of them are hopefully into well-structured, skill-based jobs that um, are paid. I mean, it's as simple as that. The notion of work experience, et cetera, those you can just like for um, uh, more flexible jobs, but you have to have st structured, skills-based, well-thought-through, well-managed programs, and not simply uh, long, flat in terms of the skill, low in terms of the management, unclear in terms of the next steps and progression. So high qual internships can be a wonderful vehicle, but they have to be well-structured, they have to be progressive, they have to be skills-based, they have to be helpful to the employer and company, they have to be helpful to the young person. The second thing I'd say is we have to remember that there's a wide range of skills and things that you, in which you can uh, not necessarily have an internship, but coming more broadly to this notion of the types and distribution of work. And there are huge numbers and the huge value on many more cognitive skills, integrative skills, problem solving skills, leadership skills, caring skills. There's a lot of opportunity and growth in the world of work and you have to not define your skill set even by your degree. That's just an aspect that you particularly learned. It might not be what you're good at. We have a, a program called uh, Project Generation that we launch in collaboration with employers and um, other funders and it really is working uh, with people who are uh, really um, not in employment or education and uh, young people around the world. We're in uh, 10 countries now working with over and have placed over 25,000 young people in jobs. It's an organization launched by McKinsey called Generation, but separate from our firm. And we really focus on the training and skills, often social skills, readiness for work, confidence skills that you need. We've got a lot of people who can do all sorts of different jobs if they've got the skills and confidence and training. So working on the parts of the economy, not always with the high tech AI, AI trained five degreed people who are still struggling with internships, but also with the people who are locked out of the workforce and really need employers to work with them for creative ways to get them the skills and get them onto the employment ladder. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think we look, all agree on the panel that unpaid internships are exploitation. And, and I think there's very good practice. The Global Apprenticeship Network is an example. Um, within Africa, we have Harambi of how to create these school to work. And by school, I mean post-school as well, transitions, um, but in a meaningful and structured way, as Vivian says. Uh, but I think importantly, um, you know, the commission's report talks about human-centered and I think what we must ensure is human enabling approaches to the future of work. Um, and I think TVET, uh, technical and vocational training, comes squarely in that. And you know, how do we, as the private sector, as governments, as trade unions, raise the profile and credibility of TVET <laughs> training, of technical skills development, um, that it's not inferior to university degree. In fact, you probably have a better chance of finding sustainable work uh, with technical and vocational education. Um, so I think it's very important that we start to position that. Um, and here again, we need young people to help us 
uh, build that um, knowledge and understanding around uh, the value of TVET education. Fantastic. And um, on that note, I'm afraid our time is ticking very short, so I'm going to hand over to Guy Ryder to wrap up with some final thoughts. Well, thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, I don't know if I can finish with thanks and, and a joke and whatever the other third of it was, Professor Baldwin, probably not. Um, just to say thank you to everybody, uh, panellists, but everybody in the room uh, for this occasion. You'll allow me a certain ILO-centric uh, last word in this, uh, this panel. It is today, you know, the hun literally to the day, uh, the 100th anniversary since uh, in that peace treaty uh, at Versailles, the, the international community decided to set up an organization to look at conditions of work as a basis for promoting social justice and, and peace in the world. It, it's quite a big day, and we're all sort of thinking about that at the ILO. But it's very, very good that we don't spend the day ruminating, a few of us older people ruminating about the wonders of the past, but try to look forward to the, the same challenges rewritten 100 years later. And I think this conversation, I hope there'll be many other occasions when we can have this type of conversation, touch on what are, I think, some of the most pressing policy issues of our time. These are not marginal issues. They're not issues that belong in an obscure international organization. I think that these are the issues which matter, uh, I hope, to, to the young people in the audience and to the cohesion of our societies as well. We're not playing for small stakes here, and I think the politics of our time demonstrate that the sorts of things we've been talking about are going to be determinate for the, uh, the direction of movement of our societies for the foreseeable future. Uh, so if the, this sort of uh, 100th anniversary of the ILO can help to stimulate this type of debate, to focus the extraordinary thinkers that we have in the room today, and more importantly, stimulate the right sorts of action uh, to move the world on the trajectory for the future of work, which is not imposed upon us, which is not waiting to happen to us, that, but we're willing and able to create, then I think well, we've done something quite important. So thanks to everybody for this event. Wonderful. And uh, maybe you could just give uh, a little round of applause to the fantastic panellists uh, for sharing all of their thoughts. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.